Hi, and welcome to our webinar on managing livestock after fires. I'm Jody Rizzo O'Brien, and I'm one of the Sheep Connect South Australia coordinators. Sheep Connect is supported by funding through Australian Wool Innovation, the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund, and Primary Industries and Region South Australia. If you want more information on Sheep Connect South Australia, please go to our website, or you can follow us on Twitter. Our speaker today is Dr. Jeremy Rogers, and he's one of the veterinarians with Primary Industries and Region South Australia, based in our Murray Bridge office. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Jody. Thanks for your introduction and asking me to present um, some of my experience and comments about managing livestock after fires, as you can see from the title slide. I don't claim to be an expert, uh, but I have had considerable experience over a number of years um, in Persa, about 19 years now, and also as a voluntary firefighter in South Australia. So. Um, there's some experience there to share. Persa staff um, have a role. Uh, some of you will be aware of this, some of you may not, but we do have a role after a fire has gone through in assessing burnt livestock, coordinating animal relief efforts and helping producers to recover. So as many of you know, um, that can be a very long business and uh, our role is sort of immediately after the fire when the next thing that, <clears throat> that uh, producers mostly care about is how their livestock going after they've looked after themselves so that's when we can step in to help. Um, livestock retained after a fire need monitoring care and treatment so you all know that um, but for some of you this may be new and for some of you at this stage following the fires that started on the 20th of December you'll now be three to four weeks out from that and, um, and you'll have animals particularly sheep at various stages of recovery and um, so here are some of the questions that that people ask us uh, and occur to you when you're in a fire. Who helps? What what help is available in this in this time when phones are down and everything else is is away? Uh, agents and friends are available, but what help is available? And uh, and who knows about this? Especially if you've never had any experience before, is treatment worthwhile? Now that's a very important question, uh, and and we'll talk about that in a minute. What do I look for? How do I determine which sheep I should keep and which animals? will be viable and which one won't be. And what are some of the common issues now, three to four weeks out from this, um, this event that I need to keep buyers open for? How often should I be looking at sheep and restocking? Uh, those are some of the questions we'll be talking about today. So livestock are stressed and suffer injuries, as, as you well know, burns to all, part, all different parts of them, head, body, limbs, and genitalia. The ones that are hardest to see, of course, are the ones that are on the underside, particularly in sheep, and that particularly involves the, the genital parts. Smoke inhalation and lung damage, dehydration and heat stress, physical and traumatic injuries, fractures and cuts, and toxemia and shock. So there's a, a spectrum of all of these um, injuries, and some are mild and some are very severe, and they require different management and assessment. There's some, um, if you're interested in this topic or you want to read more, uh, there's some good information around about assessing livestock after a fire and one of these is the Victorian um, DPI website and there's the address there on the slide. Um, however, you'll note my comment there, you should be cautious about accepting these recommendations without assessing other factors. In my experience, there's a lot of factors that, uh, that come into play when I'm talking with producers after a fire and then even three to four weeks down the tracks. Factors like what is their capacity to manage these animals? Um, what are their fences and yards uh, like? What's their mental state? How many are involved? And what's the extent of the injuries and the realistic options for, for treatments? And factors like that all have to come into the, the equation. Here's some, uh, just one or two slides we'll hear about cattle. We're mainly going to be talking about sheep, but cattle actually seem to manage and survive much better than sheep. And, most of the things that I've seen um, involve their feet, and you can see um, the feet of this animal have been affected. What you probably don't see is the udder and the teats. So um, that's what you've got to be aware of, particularly with cattle. And black cattle can be very difficult to assess, so you really need to get up very close to them in a, in a yard situation. What do recovering and surviving sheep need in the first week? So my preference is leave them alone. Basically, once you've sorted through the animals that you believe will survive and are not too badly burnt and, and you want to keep and you're able to keep, good quality hay, good quality water, and you need to check and clean that daily. Um, soft ground and some shade. It, it's important to, to stress, again, leave them be. Don't, 
try and mess with them too much. You might have to go out every couple of days um, in that first week or so to shoot animals that are clearly not coping. Um, but then two to three weeks later is your, your opportunity to reassess them and see which ones are going to be viable as breeders and, um, and animals to keep and some which you may treat and salvage and some that just need to be put down or salvage slaughter. Monitoring of these sheep uh, is required every day or two. So if you've got a hospital mob having gone through them after the fire, um, then uh, you treat or destroy sheep as symptoms develop. Many animals that are damaged can be saved and there's a temptation straight after a fire for people to jump in and just shoot everything that's been burnt a little bit. Now that may be suitable in some situations, that may be what needs to be done, but there are animals in every fire, in my experience, that could be saved. Um, and, uh, but that needs a bit of expert uh, opinion help there. So in the first one to three days after a fire, after a fire in my experience, animals are gonna die. What's going to die will die in that time from smoke inhalation and lung damage, shock and internal injury. So most of your, your losses in a very heavy fire will occur in the first day or three. Um, after that, they're generally not going to die from the immediate fire impact. Uh, but then four days, four to 10, there's going to be pain from burns and swelling and foot damage. Some treatments may be partially successful and that's where you nurse them and manage stress and just keep them quiet and nurse them. Then two to three weeks later, that's when your opportunity is to assess them again, um, look at the injuries, especially affecting feet, um, and you can get some very good response at that stage from single treatment using antibiotics and pain relief in my experience in some sheep. Again, look at your nutrition, good water, shade and soft ground. If you don't have that capacity to provide those things, then you're gonna make different decisions early on in the case, um, you know, immediately post fire. But um, some people will want to look after um, highly valuable stock and, uh, and treat them. Some things to watch out for three weeks after a fire. Um, you weren't, the wounds on those sheep will be starting to heal. Um, look at the feet. Um, feet will will uh, improve and will even if they lose the, uh, the, the slipper or the, the claw, it will grow back in time, but it can take many weeks or even months to fully grow back. Uh, but if they're managed successfully, then some will survive for that. Watch out for fly strike, especially in the weather that we have now and coming. Um, and there's the increased risk of fly strike. So be aware of that. And you may need to treat them um, preventively for that. In confinement feeding situations, which most of you will be in due to the drought and then following due to the fire, worms are gonna be more of a problem. So your opportunity, if you're getting the sheep in to treat them or examine them, you probably need to consider drenching them at that time as well, because then you're gonna be more susceptible and more, more exposure to worms, particularly barber's pole worm, in during summer rain events like we're just about to have. Be very careful feeding grain, even if your sheep have been used to that, you need to consider them, they're not well and they'll need a lot slower than normal inductions if you're gonna feed grain. And think about your vaccination. If you've got lambs, um, you may uh, be, have to especially be careful about pulpy kidney and other preventable clostridial diseases if they haven't been vaccinated. Decision made on the fate of affected livestock will take into account many factors. So this is just about every case is different. Um, so for animals that are retained and not too badly burned, breeding value and damage to teach others and male parts should be assessed. So it's important when you do that to get qualified help, someone who has done it before, who knows what to look for and can give you an opinion. And to some extent, if you ask three people, you'll get four opinions, but mostly they're reasonably obvious, but um, the real difficult ones are teak assessments on, um, on ewes and cattle. Um, an early decision to send for, for slaughter may avoid costly problems later. So um, if you've got pregnant ewes, for example, um, and you think their teats are damaged, they may not be able to rear a lamb or be, valuable, be viable breeders. As soon as they're recovered sufficient to get on a truck, it's probably better to put them on a truck at that point and send them to slaughter rather than take a risk that they won't be able to rear a lamb. Here are some um, case studies from a few years ago, but um, recent experience uh, has repeated this. So just some photos in sheep and cattle. Um, the lesions in the cattle, as you can see on the teats on the left-hand side, fairly severe. And that was simply from walking over burnt ground. These cattle were not impacted by the fire, but just these heifers were stud heifers. 
walked over a burnt ground. Uh, will those teach recover? Uh, in 50% of them, they did. Um, so eight out of those 16 heifers uh, were able to rear a calf um, and half of them weren't. The sheep on the right hand side was a group of, um, of sheep where the owner was convinced that he'd have to shoot most of them because they'd been affected by the fire and we were able to sort through them and I think we only put down about eight or ten um, but we put 60 in a hospital mob. These were valuable sheep and this um, if you look at some of the lesions here some of the burns and this is about two weeks after the fire you can see burns on the back legs in the crutch there on the face uh, and they were treated as you can see, uh, then after two weeks of simple treatment, that's the healing wound. And you can see that udder looks really good. And the, the leg wounds are healing up nicely. Um, and there's some more wounds that uh, before and after type of shots on those sheep and on the feet. So these, these sheep um, at shearing time, um, four months later, uh, that were, the owner told us that they were difficult to tell apart from the non-burn ones. How many of those will have um, significant scarring of the teeth? teats and might have been a bit of mismothering. Um, it's hard to say and that, that owner couldn't tell us because he couldn't tell which ones were the burnt ones and which ones weren't. But, um, and that's a good news story. It won't always be as good as that. But my point here is that some animals, um, if you've got the facilities and the time and the ability and the willingness, some animals can be saved with a bit of treatment and some care. Beware though, lambs don't do nearly as well as you. So, Lambs that are even slightly burnt, in my experience, don't do so well and, um, and probably need to be either put down or salvaged as quickly as possible. Here are these heifers again. Um, you can see the, the teats damaged on day one there um, on both uh, of those slides, but then two weeks later after some ointment, uh, they, they uh, healed quite a lot and those, those heifers went on to rear a calf successfully. And so there's that story again. Now, some of your decision making in cattle and in sheep will bear, will bear in mind some of these factors, how many you've got, uh, whether they're stud stock or not, or highly valuable breeding animals, is insurance an, an issue? So you need to discuss or have in, in mind what insurance will uh, do with these. If you decide to cull them three weeks later because they're not viable as breeders, will insurance still pay for the balance of, um, of the value of them uh, and so on. Nowadays, when I'm assessing teats, um, particularly with cattle, I like to give an estimate of likelihood um, on the teats to say, okay, this, this cow's got a 50% chance of rearing a calf or a 20% chance or a 60% or 70, whatever, um, based on the degree of teat damage. Then the producer can decide whether he's going to keep that animal or sell it, um, cull it to slaughter. Again, um, 2020, similar issues as previous fires. These were some animals that were treated. Um, these are not black cattle as you can see, but the, the, the evaluation is much the same. So these cattle are probably going to be able to rear a calf, um, but others won't. Final note, um, as I wrap up now about restocking, um, when, the, when the rain finally comes and the pastures start to regrow and the fences are in and so on, people are going to be looking for restockers and they'll be available at a price. Um, you might be tempted to buy them from places where there's significant biosecurity risks and bear in mind things like Yoni's disease, resistant parasites, lice and foot rot. Um, if you make a mistake here and buy without considering those things, you might regret it for years to come. So if, you want, if you'd like a bit of advice, um, some help, assistance in sourcing these animals or inspecting them if they get off the truck and where you can buy low risk animals and how you can make that assessment, um, one Biosecurity is a program that Purser has introduced, a very successful one and very thorough. Um, it's a risk assessment tool. It's free, it's web-based, and we can help you enrol in that and in that way assess yourself and then assess the stock that you'd like to, to bring on your property. That's about it from me. Thanks for joining our webinar today, um, presented by Sheep Connect South Australia through funding from AWI, the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund, and Primary Industries in Region South Australia. Thanks for joining us and we'll catch you next time.